Hello, my name is Darren Holmes. Today we're going to be looking at AC, Electrical Circuits, Lab Number 3, the Oscilloscope. This video is specifically for the Keysight series of oscilloscopes. In the description below this video, you will find a PDF version of the lab, a Word version of the lab in case you need to edit it. I will also provide a link to the previous version of this lab where we use the Tektronic oscilloscopes. The objective of this exercise is to introduce the use of the oscilloscope. The various input scaling, coupling, and triggering settings are examined along with the specialty features available with the Keysight series of oscilloscopes. Please make sure you read over the theory overview. There are a couple of important points in here. The first point they're trying to make is that the oscilloscope is a little like a voltmeter. It will read the uh, peak or peak-to-peak -peak voltages of a sine wave, but it also displays it over time, which is frequency. Most oscilloscopes can work up to 100 megahertz, whereas a typical DMM stops functioning correctly at around 1 kilohertz. The second thing they want to point out to you is that unlike handheld digital multimeters, most oscilloscopes measure voltage with respect to ground. So with our DMM voltmeter, we could measure a voltage across a resistor, but with an oscilloscope, we have to take the measurement at a point with respect to ground. So I'm going to talk a little more about this as we do the lab. So under equipment, uh, you can see the DC power supply I'm using is going to be the E3630A. Don't bother with its serial number because these serial numbers are hard to find. The digital multimeter, I'm going to use the Mastac MSM9803. And for the oscilloscope, I am actually using the EDUX1002G. Now, function generator. A function generator generates a sine wave, triangle wave, square wave. So the purpose of the function generator is to generate a signal. The purpose of the oscilloscope is to view that signal. So in the case of the EDUX1002G, it has a built-in function generator. So as far as the model is concerned, it's part of the oscilloscope and I'm going to show you where you pick up that signal on the oscilloscope later. So under components we're going to be using two resistors just to test our circuit. I've gone ahead and measured them so my 10k is actually 9.83k and my 33k is 32.95k and I have listed on the side here a picture with the resistor color code so that they're easier for you to find in your parts kit. Now on the schematic, you can see I'm using a DC power source, and then later on in the lab I switch it to the uh, function generator. But the circuit consists of a 10K and a 33K ohm resistor in series. And I've gone ahead and put it into multi-SIM so I can find out what the voltage drops across those two resistors should be. So if you remember your voltage divider rule from uh, DC circuit analysis, uh, to find this voltage drop, we take the 33K divided by the total resistance, which is 43K, and then we multiply it by the 10 volts. So you can see that it should come out to about 3 quarters of the 10 volts, and we have here 7.67 volts. And for this resistor's voltage drop, we take the 10K over the 43K total resistance, and that works out to about a quarter of the voltage. In this case, it's 2.33 volts. Now, I want you to notice on here that for the voltmeter, we can take the reading across the resistor. But when it comes to the oscilloscope, channel 1 of the oscilloscope is going to be looking at the total voltage applied to the circuit. And channel 2 of the oscilloscope will be taking a look at the voltage drop across R2. Now when we point 
to the oscilloscope inputs, it has to be with respect to something, so the oscilloscope is always with respect to ground. So the ground leads on the oscilloscope is going to go to the ground or common of the DC power supply. So when we hook this up, I'll show you that. So under procedure, step number one, it says uh, figure 3.2 is a photo of the face of the oscilloscope. So you can see here I have a photograph of the oscilloscope. And they want you to compare this to the bench oscilloscope sitting in front of you. And they want you to identify the following elements. So A is channel 1 and channel 2 input connectors. So you can see I have them labeled here. So these are the two inputs. This is where your test leads connect to your oscilloscope. B is the external trigger. C is the channel 1 and channel 2 menu buttons. So when you press these, some menu items will come up on your screen. And these keys on the side here go with whatever comes up on your screen. The screen is not touch sensitive. We actually have physical buttons down the side of the screen that correspond to these menu items. D is the horizontal scale controls. So on our oscilloscope we can look at amplitude or voltage. So that's these vertical controls here. The horizontal controls control time, so that goes horizontally across the screen. So E is the vertical scales, F is the trigger, and when we talk about triggering, there will be a small T on the side of your screen, and where it meets with this top arrow, that's where it starts displaying the waveform on the oscilloscope. G is your analyze, measure, cursor keys. So they go across here and we have a little knob to control it with. H is your save to USB. So we do have a USB connector on here and if you plug in a USB thumb drive you can actually save the display onto that USB thumb drive. I is important, auto scale. Auto scale tries to put the waveform correctly on the screen so that you don't have to adjust as many of these controls. It doesn't always work out for you. J is the default setup. Now because this oscilloscope has so many settings on it, you don't know what the last person did. So typically we go in, the first thing we do is a default factory setup on our oscilloscope so that we all start at the same starting point. K is our wave generator. So like I said previously, the oscilloscope typically views whatever we're trying to look at as far as signals are concerned. The function generator generates that signal so what we're looking at on the scope screen actually came from the generator output. So under procedure, step number two, we're to note the six buttons alongside the display screen. And it says these menu buttons are context sensitive and their function will depend on the most recently selected button or knob. So we're going to show you that as we go through the demonstration of the oscilloscope. So for right now, we want to power up the oscilloscope, and it says you must wait for it to go through its startup sequence, which is fairly lengthy. Uh, when it's done the startup sequence, you will notice the display is similar to a sheet of graph paper, where each square will have an appropriate scaling factor. It says waveform voltages and timings may be determined directly from the display by using these scales. It tells us to now reset the oscilloscope to the factory defaults. There's a lot of uh, knobs and buttons and uh, menu items that you can customize. So everybody comes along and changes them. So we'd like to start off fresh with a factory uh, setup. 
So on the oscilloscope, we're going to press Default Setup. On the side menu, we're going to select Factory Default and select OK and wait for it to finish. So under Procedure, step number two, we're going to turn on the power to our oscilloscope. It does take a while for it to go through its startup sequence, so you will have to be a little bit patient. So once it's started up, you can see that there are grids on the uh, screen. The bright green trace that you can see on here is the trace that's coming from the input. And right now we do not have anything connected to our inputs, so we expect it to be a flat line along the zero axes. The grids are subdivided into one, two, three, four, five subdivisions within each grid position. The first thing they want us to do is a default setup. So we're going to press the default setup button. Now on the side here of the screen we have the menu items we can select. They are not touch sensitive, so there is a button beside the screen corresponding to each of these menu items. So we want to select a factory default setup, so press its button. It's telling you that the recalling factory default settings cannot be undone. We're going to say OK. And that's going to set everybody's oscilloscope back to the factory default settings so that as we go through these tutorials, everybody will have the same settings. So it's a good idea to do this every time you turn on your oscilloscope because they are used in the lab by many, many students. So under procedures, step number three, you can see the procedures are fairly lengthy, so I'm not going to read the entire procedure to you. But we're going to select the channel one and then the channel two menu buttons to set up our probe. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those now. The next thing I want to show you is channel 1 is highlighted, channel 2 is not. So if you take a look in the top left hand corner of your screen, channel 1 is set to 5 volts per division. That can be changed by this vertical knob here. It changes the volts per division. Right now it's at 5, so if I rotate it clockwise, it goes to 2 and then to 1 and then to 500 millivolts per division. So that's saying each division going up is worth 500 millivolts. So here would be at 1 volt or 1000 millivolts. Channel 2 is not displaying anything, so if I press the Channel 2 menu button, you can see it's highlighted, and Channel 2 is now set to 5 volts per division. Now because this is a flat line, we're not actually looking at any wave shape, but over here you can see the horizontal is set to 100 microseconds. I can change that with this horizontal settings knob here. So I go down to 50 microseconds, 20 microseconds, 10 microseconds. Rotating it the other way increases it, so 200 microseconds, 500 on one millisecond. The traces on the screen can be moved, so we have some positioning knobs for channel 1 and channel 2. So if I rotate the positioning knob for channel 1, you can see I can move the trace upwards. If I rotate it the opposite direction, I can move the trace down for channel 2. If I want to move them quickly, to the zero line, I can just press the center of the positioning knob and it drops it down to the zero line or back up to the zero line. So under procedure, step number three, we're going to set up the uh, probe. So what we're going to do is we're going to select channel one. So that the channel one menu items are displayed. The bottom item is the probe. So we press that menu item, 
and you can see Channel One Probe has its own menu. We're interested in the second item down, which says Probe 10 to 1. So that's a ratio. So if you select Probe 10 to 1, it can be in decibels or ratio. We want it in ratio. And you'll notice that there is a circular green arrow displayed on the menu item. That references this entry knob right here. It has a small green circular arrow on it. So rotating this knob will change our probe ratio. So we need to change that probe ratio until it says one to one because we're going to be using times one probes on our oscilloscope. We need to do the same thing for channel two. Select probe, probe 10 to one, and adjust it until it says one to one. So under procedure, step number four, we're gonna select the channel input coupling. So there's basically two choices. There's AC only, or there's DC, which also allows the AC to go through. So our sine wave can have a DC offset, and sometimes we don't wanna see the DC offset, so we can disable it on our oscilloscope. Also, a lot of oscilloscopes have a third option to produce a ground or flat line. This is not available on our oscilloscopes, but it was on older oscilloscopes so that you could find the line if it went off the top or bottom of your screen. So under procedure, step number four, it says when a channel menu button is selected, options will display on the right of the screen to allow for control over the input's basic settings. So if I press the channel one menu button, you'll notice the first setting that comes up is coupling DC. So we have two different settings on this oscilloscope. If I press the coupling DC menu item, I can change it to AC coupling. So AC coupling just displays the AC portion of the waveform. So in this particular lab, we're gonna start with a DC waveform. So the coupling needs to be on DC. So for channel one and channel two, make sure your coupling is on DC and that will show the AC waveform with any DC component to it, which is what we're going to be using in this lab. So under procedure, step number five, we're going to set up the vertical scale on our oscilloscope, and we're gonna set up the horizontal scale on our oscilloscope. So under procedure, step number five, we're gonna set our scales up to take some readings. So I need to go to channel one and have its menu items selected. Now we've just changed the probe to one to one, but now I need to change my volts per division. So you can see right now they're at 500 microvolts and the lab wants us to set it for five volts per division. So adjusting the volts per division knob for channel one, I'm going to select five volts per division. Now for channel two, they want us to put the scale on two volts per division. So rotating the knob counterclockwise in my case, I'm going to set it up for two volts per division. It says finally set the input coupling to DC. So channel one, the coupling is on DC already. And channel two, the coupling is on DC. And lastly, it says align the display lines to the center line of the display via the positioning knob. Okay, so that was the positioning knob. And if you need to get it to the zero line, you just press it in and it automatically zeroes it for you. Under procedure, step number six, we're gonna build the circuit of figure 3.1. And we're gonna set our power supply to 10 volts DC. R1, we're going to use the 10K ohm resistor, and R2 is going to be the 33K ohm resistor. We're then going to connect the probes from channel 1 and channel 2 of the oscilloscope into our circuit. So I'll show you how that's done now. 
So on our procedure, step number six, we're to build the circuit of figure 3.1. You can see I've set my power supply up for 10 volts, and it comes out of the plus 20 volt terminal. So the plus 20 volts comes in and goes to my 10k ohm resistor. The 10k ohm resistor connects to my 33k ohm resistor, which goes back to the common of the power supply. The center point is connected up through this yellow binding post, so where the 10k ohm resistor and the 33k ohm resistor meet, I have a yellow wire going to this binding post. These are the oscilloscope leads that we use. You can see at one end we have a red and black banana lead that plug into our trainers. Now obviously the black one is the common or ground of the oscilloscope and the red lead is the sensing probe. At the other end we have a BNC connector. When looking at the end of the BNC connector you can see we have the metal on the outside of the case which does connect to this black banana terminal and we have a small little metal point inside and that is connected to our red banana and that's the actual signal that we're trying to measure on the oscilloscope now when you look at the end here you can see there's an indentation on either side and it slots up and goes through the actual connector when you look at the BNC connectors on the oscilloscope, you can see there's a metal outside piece, and you can see there's these two little protruding buttons sticking on the top and the bottom. So this is what your BNC connector slides onto. So to plug these cables into your oscilloscope, you need to line the notch up at the top with the top of the oscilloscope notch, and then it just slides into the oscilloscope and then you give it a twist clockwise and you'll feel it snap into position. When you've done that, you should be able to pull on the lead and it should pull the whole scope with it. So go ahead and place the second lead on the channel 2 input of your oscilloscope and also give it a twist clockwise so that it's well connected to your oscilloscope. So your channel 1 lead from the oscilloscope, the black lead is going to go to the black banana lead coming from the power supply. When you're using an oscilloscope, all the black leads need to be connected together. The red lead is going to go to the output of the power supply, which actually goes to the top of your 10k ohm resistor. The second lead coming from your oscilloscope is for channel 2. The black lead goes into the back of the black lead coming from channel 1. And the red lead is going to go to the point between the two resistors, which in my place goes to the yellow binding post. So under procedure, step number 7, it says the line should have deflected upward. So now we're actually taking some readings on the oscilloscope. So I'm going to take you through those steps now. So you can see I've connected my two BNC connectors for channel 1 and channel 2. And under procedure, step number 7, it says the line should have deflected upwards. So you can see that channel 1 is yellow, channel 2 is green. So channel 1 has deflected up two entire grid positions. So each grid position is worth 5 volts. So 2 times 5 is 10 volts, which is the applied voltage coming out of our DC power supply. Now our green line is for channel 2, and it has deflected up 1, 2, 3, not quite 4 divisions. So looking at our minor divisions on the screen, we can see that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 subdivisions in a grid. So it's actually moved up 1, 2, 3, 4, 
fifths of an entire grid position. So for channel two, it's moved up one, two, three, and four fifths of a division. So on table 3.1, you can see I've calculated my theory voltage for VR2 as being 33K over 43K times 10 volts. So that was equal to 7.67 volts. Now when it came to the oscilloscope measurement, we said the scale was on 2 volts per division, and it went up 3 whole divisions and 4 fifths of a division. So 3 and 4 fifths times 2 volts equals 7.6 volts. So you can see it's not as accurate as it was in theory. So the next step is to check it with our digital multimeter set to voltage. So connecting up the voltmeter, uh, the black lead goes to the stack of black leads, so all the commons go together. The red lead goes to that center point between the two resistors, where we're looking at channel 2 on the oscilloscope, and you can see my reading is 7.64 volts. So on table 3.1, under voltage for DMM, I've recorded 7.64 volts. So the final part of procedure step number 7 is to sketch the waveforms on plot 3.1. So you can see I have plot 3.1 and it already has the grid lines similar to your oscilloscope drawn out for you. Uh, we have to put in the volts per divisions for channel 1, which is 5. Uh, for channel 2 is 2 volts per division. And finally we need to know the seconds per division or the time. And in our case we set it up for 1 millisecond. You can see in the center of the screen I've drawn in my zero line and put a little ground symbol on it. Channel 1 moved up two whole divisions and you can see I've labeled channel 1. It doesn't make sense to just draw two straight lines across your screen and not label them because when you come back later you want to know what they are. And you can see I've highlighted channel 1 using a yellow highlighter and channel 2 went up 3 and uh, 4 fifths of a division and I've just estimated it in here getting close is good enough we just need a visual for when we come back and check our labs at a later date and you can see I've highlighted it with a green highlighter in procedure step 8 we're going to take a look at the AC coupling for the two inputs now under procedure, step number 8, we're going to select AC coupling for the two inputs. So I'm going to go to channel 1, and the coupling was set to DC. So I'm going to select AC coupling, and notice channel 1 drops down to the zero line. I'm going to bring up the channel 2 menu. The coupling is on DC, so I'm going to select AC coupling. So you can see when you select AC coupling, it actually filters out the DC voltage that was on your waveform. Now this is useful for measuring AC components of a combined AC-DC signal, but in our case we only have a DC signal. So we're going to set the input coupling for both channels back to DC. So channel 2, DC, channel 1, DC. So under procedure, step number nine, we're now going to disconnect the DC power supply. This is very important that you disconnect the DC power supply before we set up the function generator. So I'm going to take you through these steps now. So for procedure step nine, we're going to replace the DC power supply. So start by turning off your DC power supply. I'm going to disconnect the digital multimeter from my circuit. And then I'm going to disconnect the banana leads that went to the DC supply. And I'm also going to take it out of my circuit. So actually take the red banana lead away. And do the same with the black banana lead that went to the DC supply. 
So we've now disconnected the DC supply from our circuit. We're now going to replace it with our function generator. So the function generator comes out of this connector on our oscilloscope. So make sure you're using a times one probe lead and it's a bayonet connector so you just push it on and rotate it clockwise. As always, the black leads always stack together. The red lead is the power supply. So that has to go to the input of your 10K ohm resistor or channel one of the oscilloscope. So under procedure, step number nine, I now have a BNC connector connected to the generator out portion of my oscilloscope. So now I have to set up the uh, waveform generator. So I press wave gen. So under waveforms, the bottom item is wave gen. So I press that in and you can see it's highlighted in blue now. And you can see I've got menu items down the side of my screen that applies to the function generator or the wave generator built into my oscilloscope. So the first item is uh, waveform and you can see it's already at sine wave and we have that circular arrow which indicates the entry button. So I compress the button beside the waveform and you can see the different shapes I can get. So for now we want it set to sine wave. Under frequency I compress its button and I can select either frequency or period. We want to select frequency and it's already at one kilohertz which is where we want it for today's lab. The next item down is something called amplitude and you'll notice it defaults to 500 millivolts peak to peak. So we want to set up our waveform for one volt peak so that's two volts peak to peak. So we need that circular arrow to be showing up on amplitude, so press the amplitude menu button. Now you can see we've got that green circular arrow highlighted. So when I rotate the entry knob, it will change my volts per division. It starts by adding 10 millivolts, so I need to rotate it several times before it actually gets up to one volt. But that's one volt peak to peak, and I want one volt peak. So I need to increase this to two volts peak to peak, and that will give me one volt peak. Now you can see the sine wave is fairly small on the screen, so I'm going to change my volts per division, or the vertical scale. So for channel one, I'm going to change it to two volts, one volt, 500 millivolts. At 200 millivolts it goes off the screen. Now a lot of times students will leave your waveform off the screen but it's very hard to take measurements because you don't know how far off the screen it went. So I'm just going to change the uh, vertical scale back one so that it's at 500 millivolts. Now typically we leave the second waveform the same as the first waveform, so I'm going to change it to 500 millivolts just so that we can see it in relation to the input signal. Now the next thing I need to adjust is my horizontal scale. So I want to get at least one or two complete cycles on the screen. So at one cycle, I can't quite tell is it, if, did it really start right at the edge of the screen. So in this case, I like to get it so that I can put two cycles on so I can see the entire waveform or the entire period. Now one of the things you'll notice is on the side of the screen, I have something that looks like a little ground symbol indicating that the zero line is right across the center of my screen and it will have one for channel one, one for channel two and it will also have a T which stands for trigger. So right now it's triggering on the zero line where it meets this little orange pointer at the top here. 
So that's where it's actually starting to draw my waveform in. Now because the waveform is a repetitive signal, it can show me what's happening before the trigger point and what's happening after the trigger point. So one of the things they say on the instructions is the waveform could be rotating or jigging back and forth and that can be caused by the trigger level. So here we have the trigger settings. If I rotate the trigger knob you can see that the line for the triggering point is moving upwards. If it moves above the waveform it doesn't know where to start drawing the waveform. So that trigger line needs to be in your waveform and preferably we'd like it somewhere on the zero line. So the next step here it says using the scale settings determine the two voltages following the method of step 7 as well as the waveforms period. Okay so looking at our waveform the period looks like it covers one, two, three, four, five divisions and each division is worth 200 microseconds. So 5 times 200 microseconds will give us the period. Now for the amplitude, we can see that channel 1, being the yellow trace, moves up 1, 2 divisions, and it also moves down 2 divisions. So it covers 4 divisions peak to peak, or 2 divisions peak. What's a division worth? 500 millivolts. So it's actually going up one volt and down one volt. The green line is channel two and it looks like it's about one and a half. Now it would be nice to be able to use these little subdivisions between the grid lines so I can actually move my waveform back and forth. I can do that by adjusting the horizontal positioning knob so I can actually rotate it so I can move my waveform until the top peaks cross the zero line going vertically. So now I can see it goes up one whole division and one, two, almost three-fifths of a division. So I'm going to call it three-fifths of a division. So we're going to record these results in Table 3.2 and 3.3, and we're also going to cross-check the result using a DMM to measure the RMS value. Please keep in mind the RMS value is 0.707 of the peak value. So filling in Table 3.2 and 3.3, we can see the E, or the applied voltage, on the oscilloscope, we had the setting on channel 1 set to 500 millivolts. The waveform went up two divisions. So the peak voltage ends up being one volt. Two times 500 millivolts equals one volt. The RMS value is a calculation. And to convert from peak to RMS, you just multiply by 0.707. And we end up with the result of 707 millivolts. E theory was 1 volt, and we're now going to measure that with a DMM to find out what the RMS voltage is. VR2, or channel 2 from the oscilloscope, its scale was set to 500 millivolts. The waveform went up 1 and 3 fifths of a division. So that calculated out to 800 millivolts. So 500 millivolts times 1 and 3 fifths is 800 millivolts. Times that by 0 0.707, we end up with 565.6 millivolts. VR2, in theory, is just simply voltage divider that we did up on table 3.1, but instead of the 10 volts, DC, we're now using 1 volt AC, and that was a peak voltage. So 33K over 43K times 1 volt peak gives us 767 millivolts. And then we're going to check that with our DMM and see what the result's going to be. On table 3.3, 
You'll notice the scale is seconds per division. So we're actually talking about time on this particular table. So the scale was set to 200 microseconds. The waveform covered five divisions. So five times 200 microseconds gives us a period of one millisecond. Frequency is equal to one over the period. So one over one millisecond equals one kilohertz. E theory, we dialed in one kilohertz, so the period should be one over one kilohertz, and that works out to be equal to one millisecond. So finishing up the procedure for step nine, they want us to cross-check the results using a DMM to measure the RMS voltages. So right now I have the DMM hooked up across the input or the output from the wave generator and you can see that we have 0 0.705 volts so that's 705 millivolts to measure the voltage drop across r2 i disconnect the banana lead from the input and move it to the second scope probe and we can see the result is 539 millivolts dropped across r2 so on table 3.2, E-theory, the measurement with the DMM has worked out to 705 millivolts. And for VR2, measured with a DMM, it came to 539 millivolts. So then finally on plot 3.2, where to plot our waveform, and you can see once again I've put in my zero line. I've sketched in my input signal, which is channel one, and I've labeled it and highlighted it in yellow. Channel two, the voltage drop across R2, or in this case I'm considering it my output signal, and I've highlighted it and labeled it as channel two. Remember to put in your volts per division. Do not just write in 500. Make sure you put in the millivolts and 500 millivolts for channel 2 and 200 microseconds for our time per division. So under procedure, step number 10, we're going to find the voltage drop across R1. We're going to do it by subtracting the voltage across VR from the total source voltage using the math function. So I'm going to show you these steps on the oscilloscope now. So under procedure step number 10 we're going to find the voltage across R1. Now keep in mind whenever we hook up a scope lead the ground on our scope leads are actually the physical power ground lines so we can't move the ground around in our circuit because we'll short out our circuit. So what we're going to use is the differential method. Basically we're going to subtract voltage VR2. So if I subtract VR2 from our supply, what should be left is the voltage across channel 1. So in order to do that, we're going to use the math function so underneath waveforms here, you can see I have a math button. So press it in. And you can see we get a math menu down here. So what we want to do is adjust the math line. And you can see the math line is now in a pinkish color on my waveform here. So we want to make sure that we have the correct waveform here. So, function is okay, but the operator is plus. We want the operator to be minus. So, select operator, and then we can use the entry knob to select subtract. What are we going to subtract? We have source 1 is channel 1, and we have source 2 is channel 2. Now the scale is 100 millivolts, so we want it to be on the same scale as channel 1 and channel 2. 
So I'm going to press my scale button and I'm going to rotate my entry knob until it is at 500 millivolts. Now you can see here I have an offset of minus 10 millivolts. So I'm going to adjust that until it is also at zero volts because I do not want an offset on it. So on the bottom of my screen, you can see the math function, F at T, is equal to channel 1 minus channel 2. The scale is 500 millivolts, and the offset is 0 volts. So now you can see I have my input signal on channel 1, which is in yellow. I have my voltage drop across R2, which is in green. And now I have my voltage drop across R1, which is the input voltage minus the drop on R2. Now you can see it's supposed to be a small voltage, and it is indeed a small voltage, and it looks like it goes up two-fifths of a division. So I'm going to sketch this waveform on plot 3.3. If I want to remove any of my waveforms, I can remove the channel 1 waveform by pressing the channel 1 menu button. And you can see channel 1 disappears. I can remove the channel 2 waveform. So now I'm just left with the math function. And if I want to remove the math function, I can press the math menu button again. And it will remove the math waveform. So I'm going to bring back my channel 1 waveform, my channel 2 waveform, and my math waveform, so I can sketch these now. So on plot 3.3, you can see I've drawn in my three waveforms. The yellow waveform is channel 1, or my applied voltage. The green line is channel 2, or the voltage drop across R2. And the smaller line is the math result, and that happens to be equal to the voltage drop across resistor 1. Under procedure, step number 11, it says one of the more useful aspects of the oscilloscope is the ability to show the actual wave shape. So we're going to take a look at some different wave shapes and adding a DC offset to our waveform. So I'll take you through these steps now on the oscilloscope. So as you can see, I've removed the math waveform. So I'm moving on to step number 11 under procedure. It says one of the more useful aspects of the oscilloscope is the ability to show the actual wave shape. So what we're going to do is we're going to Make sure that wave gen and its menu items are displayed on the screen. The first one is waveform. So if we press the waveform menu button, you can see the circular arrow is highlighted, meaning we can use the entry knob. So we can actually adjust the waveform to square wave, ramp, which is triangle, pulse, DC, or noise. So they want us to switch back to sine wave. So it says here the oscilloscope will also show a DC component. That is the AC signal being offset or riding on the DC. We're to adjust the function generator to add 500 millivolts of DC offset. So make sure you have the offset menu item selected so that you can use the entry knob to increase the amount of DC offset. It goes slowly at first, so it's going to take multiple turns. And you can see the waveform is starting to move upwards. So once I get to 500 millivolts, you can see the waveform is now risen up. So it's moved up one whole division, and each division is worth 500 millivolts.
I'm going to turn off channel two. So now I'm just looking at channel one and you can see that every point on the waveform has been shifted up by 500 millivolts. So this is what I'm going to sketch in plot 3.4. And then finally they want us to remove the DC offset. So I'm going to go back to wave gen, bring up its menu items, make sure that offset has that circular arrow on it so that I can use the entry knob to remove the DC offset from that waveform. So now it's back to zero volts of DC offset. And I'm going to put channel two back on display. So on plot 3.4, I've sketched in my waveform for channel one. And you'll notice it actually starts one division up and each division is worth 500 millivolts. So we added 500 millivolts. So I wanted to show that the waveform is actually lifted up by 500 millivolts from where it had previously been drawn. So under procedure, step number 12, it says it's often useful to take precise differential measurements on a waveform. So we have cursors available to us on our oscilloscope, both for time and voltage. So I'm going to show you how to use those on the oscilloscope now. So under procedure, step number 12, it says it's often useful to take precise differential measurements on a waveform. For this, bars or cursors are useful. So we have a cursor button here, and we have an adjustment knob that goes with it. And you can see there's a little box that goes around it. So if I press the cursor button, it brings up the cursor menu, and you can see I have actually four cursor lines on here. So if I wanted to take some precise measurements, I would actually have to move those cursor lines. And they're done with this particular knob right here. So as you can see, as I move the cursor, this is moving X1. So it displays X1 in the corner of the screen. So if I wanted to move X1 to a zero crossing line, so I'll just move it to this zero crossing line. If I press in the cursor adjustment knob here, it now lets me move on to X2. So X2 is the second line, so I can move it to the next zero crossing point. So between X1 and X2, you can see it's written down here, X1 and its location, X2 and its location. Down here I have delta x. So you can see delta x right now says 994 microseconds. So if I make a minor adjustment to my cursor line, you can see if I get it exactly I can get one millisecond and one over delta x is one kilohertz. So you can see this is useful if you want to find out what the period or frequency of a waveform is. Now pressing the cursor knob in again I can select Y1. So Y1 is at the bottom of the screen so if I move it to the bottom of my waveform that's the channel 1 input voltage, and then press the knob again, and select Y2, and move its cursor line to the top of channel 1's waveform. So you can see my delta Y is equal to 2.04375 volts. So that's the 2 volts peak to peak that we were looking for. So under procedure, step number 13, it says for some waveform parameters, automatic readings are available. 
So you don't have to use the cursors for some of these readings and we can set up the oscilloscope to give us readings right on the screen so we can get the peak to peak voltage for channel 1, the peak to peak voltage for channel 2. Uh, we can get a readout of the frequency of the waveform. So I'm going to show you how to do all these settings. Uh, one of the important things here, it says important, if the guidelines are not followed, erroneous values may result. Always perform an approximation via the scale factor and divisions method, even when using automatic measurements. A lot of times students will have the waveforms enlarged so that they come off the edges of the screen. And once a waveform goes off the edge of the screen, it's rather difficult for the uh, oscilloscope to do automatic readings. So it's very important that the wave that you're looking at is actually visible on the screen when you're doing some of these automatic readings. So when you're done experimenting with the cursors, you can turn them off by pressing the cursor button again, and this will shut off the cursors. So moving on to step number 13, it says for some waveform parameters, automatic readings are available. These are accessed via the measure button. So if we press the measure button in, you can see at the bottom of the screen, I have frequency for channel one, it's about one kilohertz, and I have peak to peak for channel one, and it's about 2.09 volts. It'd be nice to know what the peak to peak is for channel two. So in this case, I can select source, and I can move to channel 2. Or you can use the entry knob to rotate between channel 1 and channel 2. Once you've selected channel 2, press in the entry knob. The next item is frequency. So we don't want frequency. We would like to have volts peak to peak. So I'm going to have to rotate this until I can find peak to peak and then press the entry knob. Okay, so you'll notice it's now put down here peak to peak for channel 2, 1.61 volts. So you can see these are useful measurements. There's a limit to how many measurements you can show on the screen. So you can also go back and clear your measurements. So if there's one you would like to get rid of, we have clear measurement one, two, three, or four. So I just put in peak to peak for channel two. If I press clear measurement three, you can see it removes the peak to peak for channel two. So under procedure step 13, it says you can also use the analyzer button and it features DVM. So if we press the Analyze button, and the first item that comes up is Features DVM, so press that button. Then the Entry knob, press it in, and select Digital Voltmeter. Now you'll notice it's for Source 1, and it shows up on the screen what that is going to be. Now this is an AC signal. So come down here to where it says mode, and we want to change that to AC RMS. So now it's giving us the RMS value, and since we're putting in two volts peak to peak, that's one volt peak, it's giving an RMS value of 710 millivolts, as we have expected. Under Procedure Step 14, it says finally a snapshot of the screen may be saved for future work using the USB port. So if you plug in a USB uh, memory stick into the USB port, you can actually save what's being displayed on the oscilloscope screen. Uh, it can be a little bit complicated, so I'm going to walk you through that, uh, actually saving what we have on our screen to the USB drive now. So under procedure, step number 14, it says a snapshot of the screen may be saved for future work using the AUSB port 
and a USB memory stick via the save button. So I want to show you how to do this. Um, the first thing you're going to need to do is place a USB thumb drive in the USB port. And we should get a display message saying USB devices installed. Now if you go and press save to USB, we're going to get an error message saying we have to uh, do some setup. So the setup settings are under save recall. So I'm going to press the save recall button. And you can see I've got several menu items. The first one is save. So I'm going to press it. I don't want to do a format setup, but I want to go down to the second item that says location. So under location, I want to go up to USB and I press the button in to save to USB. The next item I want to select is file name. So you might want to give it a file name. It puts it in one letter at a time. So when we go through here, it's actually going to skip through here and do it one letter at a time. So the first letter is T, and then I'm going to put in E, and then I want to find S, and then I'm going to find T. So the file name I'm going to use is called test. So at the bottom here it says save to file equals test. I've got an extra E in there, so I can press delete character and it's underscore zero. So you notice the increment item here has a little blue dot in the center, meaning every time I press the save button, it's going to increment by one number. So the first one's gonna be zero, the next one's gonna be test one, test two, and so forth. If you forget something, there is a back button here. So we can press the back button. And we did not do format setup, so I'm going to click on it, and the format we want to use is PNG. PNG is just a high resolution format to use. We can save it as bitmap. but I think PNG is our best uh, option. We're going to save it to USB. We've set up the file name. Any settings? Yes. We want to do an invert GRAT. The problem with our scope screen is it's black. And if you try and save it, it's going to save a black screen. So when we print it out, it's going to use a lot of toner or ink to print that. So if you highlight invert GRAT, it will actually print a dark waveform on a white background, saving you ink. So once you're satisfied with all your settings, you can press to save. And you can see it says file successfully saved. Now the next time you want to save something, so we can change maybe a setting or two and do another save, all we have to do is press save to USB. And it says file save successfully. And you notice at the bottom here it says save to file. So the next one is going to be test underscore two. So I save test zero and I save test one. I just want to show you the final printed result. What I've done is I've taken the uh, PNG file, loaded it into Word, and printed it out on one of our black and white laser jet printers. You'll notice the background is white. If we had not chosen the invert GRAT option, the entire grid display would have been black and it would have been hard to see any of our waveforms. It would have also eaten up all the ink out of our printers. So on the last page of the lab, I have four questions for you to answer. Uh, basically, I just want you to write the waveform expression. Uh, so for the first one, it's the waveform expression for E in step number nine, and we want it in the time domain format. 
So just reviewing back on lab number two, we have our time domain examples here. So basically it's just the peak voltage, not the peak to peak voltage, it's the peak voltage sine 2 pi f, because that's omega, and omega equals 2 pi f. And the t, right, is just the time on the waveform. So we don't actually fill in the t value. So to guide you through answering these questions, I'm going to answer the first one for you. Uh, the expression is going to be E is equal to 1, and that's the peak voltage of our sine wave. It is a sine wave, and it's 2 pi 1000 because we used 1 kilohertz signal. So E is equal to 1 sine 2 pi 1000 T. I'm going to leave the other three questions for you to answer. So when you've completed the lab, remember to have your instructor initial it to indicate that it is complete and you're ready to submit your lab for grading.